It is just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Bob Fontana. He has served as the CEO of Aspen Dental Management, ADMI, since the company's inception in 1998. With a unique grasp of the intersection between retail and healthcare, Bob has pioneered an operating model that breaks down barriers to care and puts patients at the center of everything Aspen Dental branded practices say, do, and promise. With almost 700 Aspen Dental practices across 38 states, every practice is supported by Aspen Dental Management, a support organization that provides non-clinical business support services to licensed independent dentists. ADMI provides a full range of practice support services from marketing, scheduling, billing, payroll, IT, and other business-related tasks. This model allows dentists with Aspen Dental to have the freedom to focus on their patients and provide high-quality dental care while enjoying a secure income, a healthy work-life balance, and a clear path to practice ownership. Aspen Dental branded practices are independently owned and operated by dental licenses. Um, the great thing I can say about Bob is that, man, he has been present and persistent over a very long period of time. Um, Aspen has grown and been extremely successful. I always respect that because business is not easy. I respect that Bob is quite transparent about Aspen's mission and market segment. Um, I got to listen to you lecture in uh, Chandler, Arizona, right up the street from here. Uh, when you open up your call center, let, let me tell you, how big a fan I am of yours. I, um, I, but I didn't stalk you. I was at a dentist house. <laughs> and, no, I was at a dentist house. I was lecturing for Iva Claire. And I think I was with George Tykowski or one of the dentists there. And he goes, and we were driving to his house. He goes, yeah, that's where Bob Fontana lives. And I go, stop the car. I'm going to run over there. I want to meet the guy. And he's like, well, well, I mean, do you have an appointment or did you call him? I go, no, I'm just going to knock on the door. And he goes, dude, are you sure that's cool? And I thought, he probably won't mind, but you're right, it's not cool. So, Bob, I spared you uh, from knocking on your front door uh, while going to another dentist's house. But, I mean, um, but, man, thank you so much for going on the show. A quarter of our listeners are still in dental school. And um, when they're looking at job opportunities, because in my day, when I got in 87, the only people that offered you a job and you got out of school was the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines. Yeah. And now um, um, you're providing jobs to dental graduates that all the old people like me aren't doing. Um, so um, thank you for providing jobs to the dental school graduates. Uh, but how are you doing? Doing great, uh, doing great, and uh, great to be on your show. I appreciate you having me on, for sure. You know, what, what, I, um, what, what I tell kids all the time is that even, even the older guys who um, don't like um, the fact that dentistry is being consolidated by um, going from a cottage industry to a mature industry, I say, well, regardless of what you think, I mean, Bob's running 700 offices and you're having a hard time running your own office. Don't, don't you think there's anything Bob Fontana might know that you don't know? Like, like when I went to hear you speak, I mean, you were opening up your third call center. Um, what, right. what, what do you think um, your competition of the, the old guard, how do you think they handle the phones versus Aspen Dental? Well, I'd like to think that we've learned some things along the way. There's no doubt about it. I'm not sure if we give you, maybe one of the things we need to learn is give you an updated bio, but we're at actually 800, over 800 offices now in 43 states. So, uh, you know, we continue to grow. We open up a practice, a new practice every four days. Uh, so that why that's why that number is a little fluid, but Listen, the call center is the the call center is the first experience the patient has with the with the organization. So it has to be right, and calls are important. Um, people are making choices, so you want to make sure that they have the right experience right from the start, for sure. Yeah, I mean, if if you call any any dental office, I mean, the the practice management consultants tell me that when they call their own clients, that thirty six to thirty nine percent of all incoming calls during opening hours goes to voicemail. And, um, and that's not a problem with Aspen Dental, is it? It's not. It's one of the reasons why we removed it from the practices to a call center. Today, we handle 15,000 calls a day for new patients. Think about that, 15,000 calls. And so our choice is pretty simple. We said, listen, we want to have a very consistent delivery on how we handle the calls for those practices. And so uh, typically, at least with our organization, the front desk position turns over the highest. And yet those are the people who used to take the calls. So for us, 
it made sense to consolidate those into a call center. And is that because the front desk person has the highest turnover because dentists have eight years of college, I just have four years of college, all my assistants went to a year of college. Do you think it's because a degree slows down employee turnover? Or what, why, why do you think the front desk has the highest turnover? I don't know. I mean, it's an hourly position. It's a lot of work, obviously. I think in some practices where they see they have an opportunity to grow, they don't turn over as much. Um, you know, but it is, it's a junior role within the office. So you're not, if, if one role is going to turn over the most, that's probably the role that's going to turn over the most. And, and you, um, when I saw you, you said that Chandler was your third call center. So is, is that what, so all the incoming new patient calls go to your three call centers? They do. We have one here in Syracuse. We had a small operations in Florida. We actually consolidated all of that now into Chandler I think now we have almost 450 associates in Chandler every day answering those calls, so, uh, phone calls. So Chandler is your only call center? It, it, right now we consolidated all into Chandler. That's right. That was the whole purpose of Chandler from the beginning. Oh, Syracuse yeah. and Florida and every everything? Yeah, we wanted to move it all over to Arizona. I don't know if you know this, Arizona. I think Phoenix is the call center, call center capital of the country. So it, it there's is. lots of people out there. Yeah, so it was it made sense for us. Yeah, I have a ton of pay. I mean, Amer- I think American Express has like some like four thousand call center just on their travel agency. Yeah, it There's, wouldn't surprise me. Yeah, it, it, it's a huge deal. You know, the other thing I've really admired about you is of all the DSO uh, chieftains out there, the guys leading the DSOs. Yeah. You, you're the only one who ever talked about you had a specific segment in mind. I, mm-hmm. I think, I think a lot of dentists come out of school and I say, well, what market segment are you? And they go, oh, I, I, I want to make a great car for everyone. I'm like, okay, so you're going to sell a Cadillac to everyone, but you're signing up for a, a price of a Ford Taurus or a Chevy. I mean, I mean, what, what are you doing? And you would always say um, that you, you had a target market. Aspen never was meant to be all things to all people, but you had a, a, a specific target in mind. Will you talk about that? Yeah, for sure. I mean, listen, I think all great brands understand who their consumer is, understand who their customer is, in our case, understand who the patient is. And so from us, from the very beginning, it really was trying to understand who this patient is and what their needs are. And so um, that leads really the way to the kind of the foundation of our organization. And for us, it's been pretty simple. It's been our North Star, you know, helping patients get the care that they need. And you know, you're touching on something I think is near and dear to our heart, which is, you know, there's lots of great practices out there, there's lots of great DSOs. The question is really, do they really understand, deeply understand what their patients' needs are? And we recognize for us, Howard, that people have choices and you got to earn those choices. You got to earn the right for that to, to be able to see them. And so I like to think in our best days, that's why we get 15,000 calls a day. That's why we see 25,000 patients a day. Uh, and it's, it's the reason why I think that we've opened more de novo offices, more new practices than literally anybody else, branded practices uh, than anybody else uh, in the country, Pro- probably the world, honestly. Yeah, and one of those uh, new patients, you actually stole my uncle. So thanks what? a lot, Bob. And you know why you <laughs> stole him from my practice where my price is free? I, and you know yeah. how you stole him where he no had idea. to pay money? Because whenever he came to me, um, I had to uh, take an impression and uh, and then send it to the removable lab, yeah. and he had to go without it. You know, he'd have to come in at eight and then do this and then come back at five and pick it up. And he goes, "No way!" He says, "I I can go right down the street from where I live at Aspen, and they got the lab in house. And when I go in there, Howie, you should do that, Howie." He says, "When I go in there, they do it all right there, and and it's it's all done on services." And I think what's interesting about you is when I was at ten years old. Um, about half the dentists had that lab guy in their office in Wichita, Kansas. And um, my they, they, they had a one guy making gold crowns and PFMs and a removable guy. And then everybody kind of quit doing the in-office lab thing. And then here comes Bob, not even a dentist, saying, no, 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 we're putting the lab back in. And then you yeah. steal my own uncle from me. So, so how did you how did you see um, the importance of the lab, and, and is that still a part of your secret sauce today? Yeah, yeah, it definitely is. Let, 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 if you just go back a little bit, so when we founded the business, 
I, I made a choice. I was thinking about going to school to be a dentist. Actually, a dentist talked me out of it. But I was pretty, I was pretty, I was pretty intrigued by lens crafters. And if you go back, you know, 20, 30 years ago, lens crafters forever changed the eye care industry. And if you if you remember, uh, they've got, they've moved along since then. But if you remember their original kind of brand promise and and how they positioned themselves in the market was glasses and frames in about an hour on site labs. So when we started to think about what the consumer, what the consumer's choices were, and you think about a very fragmented, you know, marketplace, your mom and pop dentists all over the country, really not competing. We thought, geez, can we really get people a different choice and understand that they have real needs and real choices? And that was really, I guess, again, the kind of the springboard to Aspen Dental. Well, you know, um, that brings back one of my um, sad summers growing up. I, I think I was about 10 years old in Wichita, Kansas. Uh, my buddy, David Hornbrook, um, his glasses, um, we were playing around and they fell off and got broken and he couldn't see without them. But then he it took a couple weeks to get into the eye doctor. Then he got a prescription. Then he sent it somewhere else. It took six weeks to make his glasses. And there we were horsing around. And now my buddy basically couldn't see all summer. And I just thought how terrible it is. But fast forward that to 2020, if that happened to, instead if he wasn't a, little Davey Hornbrook today, he did all that. He'd be back on his feet in a couple of hours. That's exactly right. right. And we, we hope the same thing happens for us. I mean, listen, at the end of the day, Howard, consumerism is everywhere. And you understand, if you think about your daily life, when do you want something? Now. When you make your mind up, right. When you make your mind up and you want something, you want it now. And I don't think dentistry should be any different than that, right? So when you think about these pa patients who are, you know, maybe pushing things off, pushing things off, and they finally make that decision to come in the office. We call those our moments of truth. We want to be in that consideration set. We want to earn their their right to come see our practice, their ability to see our offices. Yeah. Um, when I pull into McDonald's, if there's more than three cars in front of me, I just, I just go across the street to Burger King. I mean, I'm not waiting three cars uh, for a Big Mac. And I yeah. really love the fact that uh, McDonald's now has more cal calories and their coffee with creamer than a Big Mac. So you don't even have to chew anymore. You can just drink <laughs> all those right. calories. Um, That's right. I, I want to talk uh, some specifics with you. You you have right. a, a branded Aspen. Um, in the age of Yelp and Google, is it really um, smart to have um, all 800 dental offices linked to Aspen or Yelp or Google? Like, like some DSOs, um, they don't, um, if they buy a dental office, they leave your name up there. Um, and you, you, you roll them all into one brand. Um, so what, what are your thoughts on branding versus non-branded? Well, listen, I mean, you broke up a little bit there, but I think I know what you're getting at. I mean, obviously we believe in the brand for a lot of reasons. I mean, first and foremost, we look at one of the major jobs that we have is putting new patients through the doors for our doctors. I mean, it's 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 key to the practice, obviously. When you think about what the efficiency is of a brand across 43 states going, you know, obviously completely across the country, you know, we'll spend more in marketing and advertising for the brand than most D, than, than the revenue of most DSOs. Uh, I think next year we'll spend about $125 million in marketing. And there's a fair amount of efficiency as you can imagine in that. And so for us, we believe in the brand. And Listen, we understand that there are challenges. Everything aggregates to the brand. That's no different than any other brand out there. And we work hard uh, every every day to make sure that we have great patient satisfaction. Um, but at the end of the day, we believe wholeheartedly in having in having one brand. You know, Howard, we consider ourselves operators, not necessarily consolidators. There's an operations model to the brand. There's a brand promise, a set of values and a culture, all that's wrapped up under the brand. And so that's, again, found foundational to kind of who we are at Aspen Dental. So you're spending 125 million a year in advertising, which translates to 15,000 um, incoming calls a day and scheduling 25,000 patients a day. Well, we see 25,000 patients. Of the 15,000 calls per day, we schedule approximately 55 or 60% of those calls every single day. 55, so you convert about 55 to 60% are converted to schedules. That's right. That's right. And we only take the new patient calls at the call center. The call center is really 
just meant for the new patient. If you're an existing patient, so those calls, because they've already established a relationship at the office. So if you're an existing patient, you go back to the office. Huh, that is a, uh, man, you must have so much data uh, to work with on that. That's just, uh, that, that is amazing. So um, a lot of people say, okay, when I was in high school, um, all the pharmacists, all they, they all work for themselves. And now they were all consolidated into CVS and Walgreens. Um, so some dentists are wondering how big is the DSO market today? And where, where do you think the top end rate? I mean, uh, 10, 20 years from now, what percent of dentists will work for a DSO? I don't know. That's a tough one. I think if you use eye care as a proxy, I think there's a, there's a fair amount to go for sure. I think maybe the markets, it's a little definitional, like what is a DSO? So I think that's part of it. But I think if, if you believe that the market right now maybe is 20% DSO, 80%, maybe more traditional. And I think eye care is maybe more 50-50 in the way it delivers eye care. So that would suggest, again, if that model was a proxy for the dental category, it would suggest that there's still a fair amount of growth for DSOs. So you think dentistry right now is 20% uh, DSO and eye care is 50%? I think that I think that what I read is I think the delivery model is pretty is split. You know, when you think about kind of what I'll call more corporate, more branded retail delivery models in eye care versus traditional practice, so a Warby Parker or a Lens Crafters versus a traditional practice, I think I hear it's about fifty percent. And so again, don't know if that's the right proxy for dental care, but when you think about the consolidation and the movement in the DSO space. It's gone pretty. It's gone pretty dramatically over the last few years, and and I think generally, new dentist uh, coming out. I want. I don't want to say they like the model, but I mean, even for us, I mean, we'll hire four or five hundred new graduates this year. I mean, that's probably about ten percent of the class. And so you'll you'll hire how many? Four? How many? We'll hire four or five hundred new graduates this year. And how long does the average graduate stay with you? Oh, that's a good question. Um, average graduate, well, certainly the more junior, they join. They generally join as associate dentists, and, and generally they will turn over faster. But many of those new graduates will get into our ownership program. They'll stay, they'll make a career out of this. I mean, that's the goal, really, at the end of the day. We want to... We want to establish a long-term relationship with them and eventually transition them into our ownership program. So um, I've had the luxury of lecturing around the world since 1990, and I've only been able to talk to three guys like you who were actually publicly traded, and two of them were in Australia, and one of them was in Singapore. Um, so I, my question was, uh, let, me, uh, uh, let me get their names right here. Um, so in um, so the only three publicly traded dental companies uh, are One Three Hundred Smiles in Australia, uh, Pacific Smiles Group in Australia, and then Q and M. So uh, they were amazing podcasts. Um, One Three Hundred Smiles was Daryl Holmes, and um, Pacific Smiles Group is my favorite, uh, Alex Abrams, and Dr. Raymond Ang out of um, uh, Singapore, who's rapidly as expanding across China. Um, I want to ask you, comparing Aspen to those three. Um, first of all, um, those three do not have hygienists. They, they, in fact, they all have the same business model. They're open seven to seven, seven days a week. Um, they hire new kids straight out of school. And the, um, the average uh, dentist stays with them about five years. But I was wondering a couple questions on that. Um, why are none of the big DSOs like you or Heartland or Pacific, why are you not on NASDAQ? Uh, these guys are publicly traded. And why do they not have hygiene? And what's your thoughts on the hygiene department? So, yeah. Okay. So, I, I mean, I think for us, I don't want to speak for Heartland or Pacific of those guys. I mean, for us, we don't feel the need to access the public markets for capital. I mean, it's really that simple. And we have, you know, we have a business that cash flows pretty quickly. Uh, we like the returns and the, the de novo model. That's why we built 800 of them. That's why we open up a new one every four days. So when we think the returns, the kind of cash on cash returns for that model is 
compelling and, and fairly predictable. So there's really not a great reason, at least at this point, uh, to access the public markets. Maybe at some point there will be. I don't, I don't know. But my view of the world is this. Grow and operate a great company. Everything else will take care of itself. If we want to go public, we'll go public. If we want to bring in more private equity, we, whatever we want to do, first thing is go go grow it and 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 manage a great company, lead a great company. So, on the hygiene question, we love our hygienists. We we have uh, the practices have great. Uh, there's a great hygiene practice. Uh, it's led by two wonderful individuals who would do a great job focusing on uh, on supporting the hygienist day in and day out. And I can't imagine having a healthy practice without having hygiene in it, truly. I mean, it's just it's a part of what we do in this country. Um, I think it should be a part of the dental practice. It is for us. And um, I don't see it going anywhere. So do you have a, um, a model? I mean, um, <clears throat> like, does the average Aspen... Uh, you, you have 800 locations. Does the average one have two dentists, two hygienists, two assist? Is there a model for the average uh, Aspen? Number of yeah, operatory, I mean, square feet? Is it, yeah, it yeah, kind of like, sure. is, is it a standard model? 3,500 square feet, generally seven to eight operatories. Um, as it matures, usually has two full-time dentists. It'll have a de- uh, hygienist and a half. Uh, it'll have oral surgery and, and Adonis coming in and out of it, kind of the itinerant model. Um, they all have on-site labs, as we've noted before. Um, and so when you look across the country, really at the end of the day, they all operate, generally speaking, on the same model. So when you Some say on-site so labs, true. is on-site one word, O-N-S-I-G-H-T? I think there's a hyphen in it. Is there? So it's on- I don't know. Uh, on-site labs. Um, so it's 3,500 3, square feet. You said seven to eight ops. Yep. Seven to eight ops. Um, it matures at two full-time dentists. So you start with one and then you try to grow into two. Yeah. And some, you know, listen, some will have three and whatnot, but for the most part, if you take a cut at it, the mature offices generally have two full-time docs. Okay. And then 1.5 hygienist. Yep. Is the point five one? Uh, is she is she like all right? She's okay. Yep, she's, she's okay. all right. You, you just removed oh, her yeah, left he, arm and left leg, he, so she's all right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, on-site lab, and, and what's the on-site lab? Is that one removable guy? Is that usually yeah, one employee? That, it's usually it's usually staffed by one. Sometimes in busier offices, could be two technicians. Yeah. But it's mostly for removal. It's not Crown and Bridge or CAD CAM or CIRAC or. It's not Crown and Bridge. It's mostly yeah. It's mostly removable night guards. Um, um, you know that type of stuff. Um, but yeah, mostly the mostly acrylic. So 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 you kids listen to this guy. I mean I mean do you know you know you. you do you know anybody who has built 800 practices from scratch and got them all up and running uh, without the need to go public? Uh, but there are 3,500 square foot offices, seven to eight ops, you say? Generally speaking, yeah. Uh, they mature, you know, start at one dentist, go to two full-time dentists, one and a half um, hygienists, an on-site lab uh, for removable. Um, what, what were your... Th- did you say about specialists? Which specialists do you yeah, have? Usually we'll have an oral surgeon and an endodontist coming in, uh, you know, kind of rotating through uh, a territory. Oral surgeon and endodontist? Yep. Um, I can vouch for that. A lot of my friends, and when I say friends, I mean uh, myself included, uh, when young kids come in and work for you and they, they start wanting to learn how to place implants. So they place four or five implants that first year and they do a dozen molar endos and then you have turnover. And then over the next two or three or four years, you get to pay a periodontist to redo every one of those implants yeah. and redo those root canals. And so now some of my friends that have, um, three or four locations, uh, they they are only letting endodontists do the molar endos and periodontists place the implants because of the failure rate of the uh, of, you know, the general dentist doing it. Did you did you do that for those same reasons? Were you having those same issues? It's a little bit. It's a little bit of that. It's also just a little bit of listen. You're going to have people who are diff- comfortable at different things. So the owner doctors, you know, some of their practices may be pretty adept at them. 
others may not be. I mean, we're going to support them either way. We're going to, we have all sorts of programs, continuing education programs, clinical support programs. I mean, we just enrolled, rolled out Invisalign last year, for example. And so ortho was not a part of the practice uh, up until last year, but we went out and hired, we think some pretty talented folks who um, one, one person in particular came from Invisalign uh, and another person who was one of the leading uh, Invisalign producers and doctors across the country. And we said, listen, if we're gonna go support the doctors, let's go support them the best we can and give them the right, uh, right tools to be successful. So we, we, listen, at the end of the day, the, we, want, we, want our, we want the doctors to do what they're comfortable with, but we also wanna help them in their journey to continue to be a better dentist. So who, you gotta tell us the names, who, um... Who's your Aspen um, Invisalign uh, thought leader? So we have Dr. David Geller, who runs, uh, who really supports the Invisalign initiative. Um, he still does a lot of lecturing actually for Invisalign. So uh, he's, he's been really instrumental uh, in rolling that out. We were the fastest ramp in Invisalign's history last year. Um, and so we're pretty proud of that. Still a long way to go, but we're pretty proud of where we've been. And then uh, Dr. Uh, Rawal actually just joined us, Sandeep Rawal, who's going to now lead and support our implant initiative across uh, across the country as well. Well, I love uh, David Geller. He's a uh, neat guy. Uh, please uh, tell him uh, to come on the show and tell us what he's... Uh, um, oh, he'd be happy to, I'm sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. Tell him. I, I, I really, yeah. um, I really would love to hear his thoughts on that. Um, so who was, who was the other guy you said? Uh, Sandeep Rawal. How do you spell that? <laughs> uh, Sandeep and then R A W A L. Spell Sandeep what? Say spell last name again. R A W A L, I believe. R A W W A L. Yeah. Rawal. It's yeah, and well, so I, he works. He works with the clinical leadership team to develop the programs to really help both on the restorative side, on the surgical side, on the placement side. So he works really pretty deeply with the clinical team and will support the doctors to continue to enhance enhance their skills. Well, um, talk about uh, is is Sunri uh, Rural is that the um, the prosthodontist out of um, Florida? That's right. Oh, yeah. my, oh okay. Wow. Uh, yeah, yeah, I've had him on the show. That guy is amazingly smart. So why is a prosthodontist helping you with your Invisalign? No, no, no. He's helping with our implant initiative. So oh, what, oh, okay. What, okay. That was, what you were asking is how do you get doctors better? What I'm saying is what we typically do is go out and find great leaders who have been are, are really strong at certain areas of the practice and say, let's go leverage them to really help the general dentist population across the 800 locations. Yeah. Okay. That, that makes sense. So, um, let, let's talk about, um, I'm still back on your model. So you have oral yep. surgeons and like, say I, um, I, I, I give you so much credit hiring 500 kids out of school. I mean, really Bob, I, I tip my hat, um, <laughs> be, because when I was little, the only the army, Navy, air force Marines would do that. And yep. I know guys, my age do not want these kids. And I have to say on my own show, I don't want them either. Because yeah. I, I, I let them do 20 uh, implants and 20 molar root canals, and then I got to pay uh, for the periodontist up the street or, you know, to, to redo all that stuff. And so if you, if, if you could ramp these graduates up, you know, my, my power to you. Uh, but back, back on that model, um, what, what about the expensive stuff? CAD cams, CBCTs, lasers, I mean... Those are a hundred thousand dollars a pop. Do you? Yeah. What What is your high technology expense needs on your de novo, new Aspen dental office model? Right. Well, back up for a little bit. Um, on the new grads, we love them. We absolutely love them. They're They're hungry. Um, they want to continue to learn. I mean, there's a lot more than dentistry than just teeth. And so, if, when you come in our programs, it's really about wanting to hopefully make that progression into a lead doc, into an owner doc, thinking about how to lead people, manage people, really supporting them along the journey. And so all I really care about is that they come in open-minded and they're willing to learn and they'll have a great, they'll have a great journey here. And we've got programs, we've got 130, doc, 130 mentor doctors across the country. And we understand we will be as good as our learning and development programs. And that is really kind of central. That investment is really central to their success. So we're excited to have them. We love, we love them. And 
Um, and and you'll be surprised at how fast that they 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 ramp up. So uh, on the technology side, listen, we have as I mentioned in Bizline, I I think we weren't big on CAD CAM. We had, you know, we had I would say maybe eight to ten machines. Uh, I don't know, with limited success, to be honest with you. We just didn't get the traction. We poured some time and money into it. And I'd say that half of them maybe probably aren't even getting used today. But I would say the iTero, from a technology standpoint, has been very positive. It's easy to use. Um, it supports uh, new patient, you know, just the acceptance and the treatment planning. Obviously, it's critical to Invisalign. Helps with Crown and Bridge. Uh, a lot of efficiency there. We think there's there's a you know uh, uh, better image, more efficient for the lab, kind of all that stuff. And now that we're doing implants, we're going to do a CBCT across the country. Um, and so we believe it's the right a CBCT uh, one for every location across the country. Which one yep. are you going to go with? Um, I believe we chose CareStream because um, we have a CareStream ecosystem today. We put it up, and they have. There's some really good things about about their system, including that I'm not familiar with all the moving pieces, but particularly the treatment planning software we like a lot. Um, but we just we believe in terms of a standard of care, doing that type of work is really important to us. So we're going to make the investment. I think this year alone, we'll probably put in four or five hundred CBTs in offices this year alone. Good Lord. So uh, do you get free uh, tickets to Atlanta? Uh, do you get season <laughs> tickets to the Braves games or? Well, listen, CareStream has been a great, CareStream has been a great partner of ours. And, and I would say this, so we went through, I mean, well, listen, one of the advantages the docs get for joining us is we will run a pretty tight process, uh, RFP process, and it, it enables us, um, we think to get best in class pricing and support and service. And so, uh, we're happy with, with the way CareStream responded. We're excited to continue to roll this technology out across the offices and doing it with them. My gosh. Is this going to be uh, Lisa Ashby? Uh, is this going to be her greatest year ever when she sells Aspen <laughs> Dental 500 uh, CareStream? I don't actually, know. You'll have, you'll have to ask her. I don't know. You, you know, actually, you're making me feel better because that's the one I went with. And, uh, oh, is that right? Yeah, I, yeah. I went with the CareStream CBCT. And I also want to say that um, I never um, – it's amazing how a business mind like you didn't see the value in the CAD CAM either. I mean, it just, just didn't yeah. uh, didn't make sense. But but when you say Invisalign, that brings up an, uh, something else interesting. Um, so in orthodontics, is, um, it's 6500 bucks. And yeah. Invisalign rolled out clear aligners, and they worked with the orthodontist and – but it's still, you know, high dollar, $6,500. Mm-hmm. And then the American way is that you have some innovation technology. So here comes Smile Direct Club out of Nashville. And they say, you know what? We're going to use that oral scanner. And we're going to have AI design the deals. And we're going we're gonna to squeeze cost out of this, which is mostly labor. And we're going to go direct to the consumer. And we're going to deliver him a lower cost ortho for $2,500. And when I got out of school, a big screen TV was $5,000. And it was, <laughs> it was a, a yard deep. Now they're yeah. $500. And you can hang it on a nail on the wall. So why the difference? Why did uh, why does it work for big screen TVs and not orthodontics? Because Smile Direct Club, I mean, it was it was one of the most uh, it, it was it was a, a a crazy event for orthodontists. Their rollout, I mean, it's just been a lot of stress. So, um, it, what what was your assessment of that? Why why so different for uh, high technology, low cost option, good for big screen TV, bad for clear aligners? Well, I don't know that it is bad for clear aligners. I think a couple things. Technology is going to continue to evolve. It's going to continue to change. There's no doubt about it. And, you know, what we, I'll tell you what we believe. Um, we believe that people deserve value. They're going to want to go where value is. I mean, if, if, if Smile Direct Club did one thing, they showed, I think, the world that people need more ortho than what you think, and they've democratized it. And for $2,000, they understand that price is a big deal. It's an issue for people. And so when people can't afford it, they don't get it done. And so I, listen, I don't, I think we believe that we want to blend the right technology, but also have the doctor involved. You're moving teeth inside bone. I think it's critical. And so, um, listen, technology is going to continue to 
evolve. Consumers are going to make choices, um, and it's our jobs to make sure that we do. We have the right technology, the right price we're offering, um, and also do the right thing for the patient. And blending those things together, I think, is really critical. So, um, yeah, um, I mean, money's the answer. What's the question? If you move braces from sixty five hundred to twenty five hundred, I imagine four to five times as many people would be getting braces. If it's one third the cost, yeah, and price if, elasticity if do, is you, a real thing. Yeah, if you do it, but you have to do it right. Uh, and again, I don't, I'm not, I don't, I'm not familiar enough with SDC's process to, to opine on whether they're doing it right or doing it wrong. We believe, our doctors believe, it should be done. The dentist involvement should be. Uh, it's consistent with state regulation; they should be involved. But at the same to- token, we also understand value, price, convenience is really important. It's the backbone of our brand, and we're going to work hard to continue to provide that level of value to the patients. So do you, um, Joe the Hogan... Price down, Howard, for sure, price will come down. Yeah. It's it's going to. There's no doubt about it. I mean, it's it's going to happen. So, so, um, so ba- basically, um, what he's saying, um, if you kids are a little younger to understand, is... Um, Invisalign, Align Technology, the CEO is uh, uh, Joe, um, Joe Joseph Hogan, Hogan uh, who I've been trying to get on the show as long as you. Uh, so I, <laughs> you, if next time you see Joe, say, well, Howard got one of the two. All right. uh, but All he, right. owns, he owns Align Technology and he owns iTero. Uh, they have two products. And what some of the dentists want to know and what I want to ask you with such a big sample size is some say – that when the dentists are old like me and take their impressions with uh, Impergum and send it to the lab, uh, that there's more remakes than when you take it with an oral scanner and iTero and send it in. And um, do you you should have data on that. I mean, do you think um, an Impergum has more remakes than a uh, oral scan? Or w- w- what is your uh, thoughts yeah, on this? Yeah, I don't have... We're, we're compiling the data now. I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, but anecdotally, I would tell you that the team believes that the digital scan is more, more accurate. It's more efficient. It's more accurate, particularly when um, you become efficient with that machine. So it's unlike CAD CAM, it's pretty easy to use, as you know. And I think iTero, I think 3Shape, those organizations continue to evolve that product in a way that I think is going to continue to help uh, both the dentist and the patient. So... Um, and interestingly, what you'll see for us pretty soon is we'll be going towards digital dentures. And we believe the scanning, that that technology exists. It's a better fit. There's less remakes. There's a lot There's a lot happening in that world. And so, um, you know, again, we're going to continue to push hard to leverage technology where we think it makes sense and where it's ready for our organization and then deploy it. Uh, digital denture d- dentistry is big here out in Phoenix. Yeah. There, there, there's some major players out here. Yeah. Um, so, but did you, um, I mean, you could have gone three shape, uh, their trio scanner, 3M has true def. Did you like, did you want to go with the oral scanner from, um, iTero because you're rolling out Invisalign and they're both owned together and that's a, um, a, a more simple closed system working together. Was that a big part yeah, of it's that? Just, it's part of that ecosystem. I mean, I think, listen, Invisalign's got a great product. Joe and the team do a great job. And, um, you know, we just, we like that closed loop system. Um, and we're, we were happy going, we listen, we like three shape too. Don't get me wrong. I think it's a great product. Um, but we came down to, we just felt like the ecosystem in and around the line made sense for us. And so if we're going to use Invisalign, then we should use iTero. Um, the Japanese have a very interesting saying. They say, "Successful man fall down seven times, get up eight. Uh, <laughs> you, you've been you've been in this game a long time, yeah. and uh, so where did you fall down along the way, and what did you learn from it? And they say, if uh, if you learn a lesson, it's not a mistake. What what have you what what have you learned along the way that you could tell some young kid not to do that? To don't uh, you've already stuck your finger in that electrical socket." And you don't advise it. What well, what what have you learned along the yeah, way? Well, a lot. I mean, I got and I got the pr- bruises to prove it. But <laughs> listen, I mean, what 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 we knew in the beginning, we were pretty. I think we were pretty along far along the curve. We understood we had an operating model that works. You know, a la lens crafters. We knew that. I knew that. And rolling that out. And when the organization was small, 
you know, you could get your arms around the organization. You could communicate. You knew everybody in the organization. And all of a sudden we turn around, we look around, we're like 150 locations. And I'll never forget it. I mean, I, I, I went to the organization in 2011, 2012. I remember saying, geez, you know, we have some cracks in our armor. And the reality was for me, Howard, there was a, the learning lesson for me was people matter. And people matter a lot in this business. And every dentist, every leader, every manager, I mean, this is, we have 800 locations. They're all branded Aspen Dental. They all look the same. They're all built the same until you open the door. At the end of the day, we understand that people matter the most. And we have 12,000 people going into the offices every single day, team members, and having clarity on who we are, what our values are, what our purpose is, what is the why of this organization. And so all I would say is for, for you know, younger DSOs or groups starting out there, yeah, it took me a little while. We had to have some bumps in the road, but I, I thought values, culture, that was just an HR thing, you know, and it was just kind of soft stuff. But there's, the reality is if you want to have a, a, a successful, enduring organization, it, they are the foundation of what we do. Um, and in particular, the doctors and how we support them, I think. You know, for us, we understand a long time ago, we understood that we want to build this business with our doctors. And that was critically important. We don't want them just as employees. We want them as true partners. And again, if you think about the people component to this business, it starts with them. And, and so we make big investments in that all day long. We believe that the patient experience will never exceed that of the team experience. And it starts with the team. So when you have a bunch of capable people across the organization, 12,000 of them, if they come in with a great deal of clarity, who is this patient? What are we trying to do for them? How do we help them? And if they understand what our brand promise is, then we have a bright future. If we stumble on that, then we'll have to reset. And um, that's kind of the difference between uh, Joseph Hogan, the CEO of Align Technology, rolling out Invisalign with the orthodontist versus Smiles Drug Club trying to go, um, trying to eliminate them, the orthodontist. I mean, they yeah. want to eliminate them to, to lower the cost. I, I get that. But do you think that was a big part of their, um, a big part of their dilemma? I mean, they're trying to reduce costs by eliminate the orthodontist. Yeah. I mean, listen, I, I, Joe, again, I'd say Joe and the line have a great product. I think one of the challenges is when you have outside people impacting your brand every day, that's hard because they can't control things related to their brand. They can't control price. They can't control service. They can't control all of these other things related to the brand. That's hard. And so I think um, in, a, in our case, in Smile Direct Club's case, in other cases, when it's your organization, you control the brand promise. Uh, and um, listen, they'll figure it out. Don't get me wrong, but that's, that's a tough position to be in. Yeah. Um, I wonder, um, of course, every, everyone wants to know also because the, uh, um, it, it the the stock is like um, it's almost like a daily uh, um, movie on Dental Town. I remember everybody was talking. They they follow that stock crazy. Um, who who do you think you know who your customer is? You've been very focused on your customer. Um, who's your competition? Is it more other large scale DSOs or is it um the or is it the fact that the older dentists are going to do the status quo and not change? Um, who, who, who's your competition? The status quo of the old guys or the up and coming uh, DESOs who are following your your lead? I don't know. I, I mean, we, we have competition for sure. So I, this is always a funny question. I, I actually believe, though, the competitions are self. Honestly, I really, truly mean that. Like, we'll go into any market. We don't care about the supply ratio of dentists and population and all that stuff because we understand our – we think we understand our patient better than any other group that's out there. I mean, I just got a call. I mean, I just got, I really – I got a call, probably second one I've had, this one right before the holidays from a CEO of a DSO that said, how do you open up so many de novo locations? And I pushed back on him and said, well, tell me, like, who do you focus on? He's like, what do you mean? When you open up a DeNovo, who do you focus on? What do you do? What do you stand for? He's like, well, we do family dentistry. Family dentistry? What, what kind of target is that? It doesn't make sense to us. If you're in my shoes, that doesn't make sense. We see the world like Starbucks and Dunkin' Donuts. Everything that they do, everything that Starbucks does, they do with purpose based on the customer that they want to draw through their store, the color of their stores, their environment, their pricing strategy, their options. 
hours, coffee maker, the barista, everything is intended. They, they think of the world, you have home, you have work, and they're the third place. And that's very different than Dunkin' Donuts. Not one's right or wrong, but when, you, when I get asked the question, for us, going to market and understanding, it really starts with the end user in mind. Who is the patient? What are their needs? And how do we help them in a way? Because we, listen, we understand that they have choices. So yes, we have competition, but at the end of the day, we had to understand that the world's going to continue to change. And that's why I get frustrated sometimes by the traditional practice, because yes, we get, sometimes we get arrows slung at us and all that stuff, but the world's going to change. Technology is going to change. Consumers are going to demand it. No different than you. I mean, think about it. I mean, how many years ago, you, you, you would never have thought to take in an Uber. Who would have thought that we would need a new taxi service? But all of a sudden, Uber is everywhere, Lyft's everywhere, because it's a platform that consumers have decided to use. So we could bury our heads in the sand, or we could say, what do the consumers want? And healthcare, unfortunately, for, maybe fortunately for us, but unfortunately, has been more about the doctor's rules than the consumer's rules. And the consumer now says, nah, I'm not sure about that anymore. In fact, I don't know if you know this, we have a small urgent care business as well. We bought an urgent care business at six locations. We're now at 45 locations. We'll be close to 100 locations by the end of the year. And it's the same thing. It starts with the consumer in mind. And so for us, um, again, we have competition, but at the end of the day, it's do we have do we have people every day coming into our offices, understanding our values, our purpose, our brand promise, and executing on that every day? That's what's critical. So Aspen bought an urgent care business? That's right. Yeah, in 2016. Well, and, and tell us, um, Aspen Medical Center. Is that what you're calling it? or No, it's called WellNow. WellNow Urgent Care. And we build them out in some cases right next to the it, offices. It's called we'll WellNow? Yep, WellNow. WellNow. Um there it is, uh, htretail.com. Uh, Let's see what it says. Um, Horvath and Trimble sells Aspen Dental and Well Now Urgent Care in Lakewood, New York. Wow. I have, Now, have you rolled that out in Phoenix? We're not in Phoenix yet, no. Okay. We just, we're still marching from New York, going across Ohio into Illinois. That is genius because in Arizona, 8.5% of emergency room visits are odontogenic in origin. Is that the kind of the guts of why this happened? Yeah, you have that, and you just have the overall kind of, if you think about our core capabilities in understanding kind of the consumerism in healthcare, we think that is really core to what we do. Not to mention how we work with insurance plans, revenue cycle management, marketing, site selection, team development, leadership and development. So dentistry is obviously really important to us. The Aspen Dental is the 800-pound gorilla in our universe. But we also know there's a lot more that we can do within healthcare. Um, and now that we have kind of the, the infrastructure, we believe we could, we could develop other platforms and brands as well. Wow. Um, that is amazing because I always have said – if I was going to start my own DSO, it would be I would I it would be inside the emergency room of every major hospital in America, uh, because when I go to those emergency rooms, um, that's what they always tell me. The data I see, it's about you know eight and a half percent for Arizona, and they can't do anything. It, it, hospital, you, you said that healthcare has been more about the rules of the doctor than the consumer. Well, no, but nobody explains that better than a hospital. They can remove a brain tumor, give me a bypass, amputate right. my foot for diabetes, but they right. can't touch a hot tooth. Yeah, right, right. Or they can't even figure out how to bill you. And so, I mean, they really don't really understand, again, not to disparage anybody, but at the end of the day, we just, again, fundamental to what we do is, is really trying to understand the consumer. By the way, the doctor's a consumer too, and- how we help them, how we support them is just as critical because at the end of the day, when you think about, obviously when you think about Aspen Dental opening a new location every four days, it has to be done in partnership with our doctors. And so, you know, when we think about the business support services that we provide them, those are really, really critical and paying attention to their needs is just as important for us. And so we go to market the way we think about our strategy is not just you know, the patient, but it's also the doctor and how we can continue to support the doctor to be great at the roles that they're in. Huh. I, I'm trying to look at what would be the best, um, um, 
summary of uh, your uh, well now urgent care. Um, what, 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 what is the business model of your well now urgent care? Well, it's, it's, it's seeing a patient you know, immediately. It's, it's all walk-ins. And we see that patient for roughly, I think the average ticket's $125 compared to the emergency room at $900 um, and doing it with five-star service. I mean, I mean, we really try to make sure that that patient, think about it, you know, your son gets hurt in a sports game or your daughter gets hurt in a sports game or you got sick and you're, you're running your family, doing all that. You can't get a hold of your primary care physician. You don't want it to go to the emergency room. And so that's where we intersect. And so we think about that business almost as a portal. We're going to help you out. We're going to get stabilize you. We're going to help you out. And then if you need to go back to your primary care or you need to go back to your own physician or whatever it may be, your specialist, uh, then we'll do it. But um, um, but that's a great little platform. Uh, we're, excited, uh, we're excited to uh, continue to roll that out um, across the country. Um, I, you're so generous with your time. I'm, rapid, I'm coming down to two more questions. But when we look at dental uh, dentist income, um, it's no doubt that... Um, you know, the average American specialist makes 320 a year. The general only makes 197. Um, for general dentists, family dentists, um, if you own your own practice, you make 244. If you're an employee, you make 147. Well, a lot of that is because of our amazing, insane U.S. government 60,000 page tax code, uh, which you probably can go your whole life without ever meeting anyone who's read all 60,000 pages of that tax code. Um, you have owner-operated practices. Um, mm -hmm. Do you see um, just the fact that you're an owner-operator um, in Aspen, that the change in tax code is a big part of this material difference of why the average employee dentist makes 147 and the average owner operator dentist makes 244 is a lot of that tax code and is there a chance that if someone works for aspen that they would be an owner operator and that tax code would benefit them yeah i mean listen i think there's probably some some benefit i think it's de minimis in the scheme of things let me let me walk you through so we hope we call it dating. We want you to come in. We want you to love the organization. We want you to be passionate about what we do every single day. And we want you to learn. And we want you to become a lead dentist. And eventually we want to get married. We want to become an we want you to become an owner doctor within our system. Our average owner doctor makes roughly a half a million average, a half a million dollars a year on average. Our top guys are making in excess of four million. And let me let me uh, let me make sure you understand. I think what's critical for me because I talk to a lot of young doctors over time. Dentistry is great. Obviously, it's a great it's a great category, um, and and we're blessed to be in it. But dentistry is also physically demanding, and it's hard when you're sitting there and you know you've been practicing for a lot of years. So what we try to do is we try to encourage doctors to think more than just about the mouth, more than just about the tooth. What they can do to monetize their license how to become an effective leader, an effective manager, and leverage the shit out of us and our infrastructure and our organization in a way that allows them to have multiple offices and a practice they never thought possible. To me, at the end of the day, that's the dream that we're trying to say, listen, you don't need to be a mechanic for 50, for 40 years and sell that practice for maybe less than you put into it or the less you bought into it 35, 40 years from now. We're trying to say, listen, go into it with the best in my opinion, obviously I'm biased, the best group, the group that's opened up more practices successfully than anybody else in the world. And let us partner with you in a way that could change your life in a very meaningful way. And those are the people we want to go on the journey with us. That's what's critical here. And so uh, for my part, listen, we're going to help them with all their clinical stuff for sure. We're going to develop them, but we uh, there's so much more to dentistry than that. And for those of them who are open-minded and want to continue to learn, uh, we're, we're, we're completely invested in them because we know our business can't grow without them. And so that's been a great partnership for us over the years. Um, and it's allowed us to be who we are today. Why don't you get, do you have one in Arizona that would come down in my studio and, and, sure. and go into detail about that? Yeah. Dr. Sung, Dr. Mather, they're great owner doctors right in Arizona. We love them. They're, they're absolutely terrific. Are they, are um, they in the same office? No, those are two different owners in the in, in Arizona. We have multiple owners out there. Well, They've been out there the longest. Well, I got I got two chairs right here. Right. They would be. They would do it. I'm sure they would do it in a heartbeat. They they love 
uh, their practice. They love Aspen Dental. They're great doctors. They're great partners. Um, and um, we're blessed to have them on our team for sure. What I love is, uh, that's why I call my show Dentistry Uncensored. I don't want to talk about anything all the dentists agree on. And that's um, that. That's why I, I got to say one thing about Dental Town, like all social media. Um, you know, the founder of Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg, you know, his dad's a dentist. And mm-hmm. um, basically, when you look at all social media, 1% of the people are make all the original content, about 9% engage, but 90% say nothing. Uh, so you get this very skewed, confrontational, kind of like when you watch the news and two people are arguing with each sure. other. So right. um, um, I, I don't like to talk about anything they all agree on. I, I like to talk about what's new, what's 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 uh, um, the change. And uh, so I, I, I would love to have those two guys uh, come on and talk about some. Hell, it didn't even exist when I got out of school. And, and now um, the world is ever changing. Uh, so, um, my gosh, I, I'm trying to think of what else um, um, I would look smart. Um, I, I want to revisit one last question again. Yeah. Um, but but you're, you, um, you still like the single branding um, versus uh, each store have their own name because that's just a big part of your formula. Listen, I, I just think I, I don't want to sound – disparaging. I I come from, I come from a place of we're one organization trying to do, you know, trying to execute on a set of values, purpose and promise under this brand every single day. I don't really understand the consolidators. And again, that's not taking a shot, but they have hundreds of locations. Maybe some of them, they bought all these different microcultures, all these different, you know, different ways that they go to practice and they go to market. And I just think that's, that's a little bit of a roll up. And I look at our business completely different. By the way, we're in the business of putting doctors in business. We're not, think about it, we're not buying anybody out. We don't go out and we don't offer, you know, uh, uh, Howard a check to buy his practice and hope that you'll work there for two years. That's not our model at all. We're, we're doing the opposite. We're saying, hey, you're, you're a young doctor trying to figure out what your journey is. Come take that journey with us. And let's go into business together, right? You own the clinical charge. You own the clinical director. You, you own that. That's all, that's all the same. But you've got a business partner who has all this data, all this marketing horsepower, all this information in a way that's going to make you successful, make us successful. Let's do that together. And so, um, you know, for us, um, again, that's just, it's, it's, it's just, it's just kind of who we are. And, I think that um, the the well now urgent care. I mean, I've always said if I was going to start a DSO, it'd been emergency room dentistry, and I would have put it right in the parking lot of every major hospital in America. And sure enough, your how many locations of this do you have? Uh, on the urgent care side, side now, I, we're I think we're at forty five. And those are all going to be called well now urgent care. Oh, they're all now. Yeah, it's all well now. All single branded, same thing, same branded brand branding strategy. Yeah, and why why did you not want to call it um, Aspen Well now, or you thought it confused dentistry and medicine? We're we're concerned. We went through that. We went through some of that work. Believe me, it was on the list. It was a tough call, but we like we, we like where we are with Well now. We think it's uh, we like the name, and um, and it works for I think that industry pretty well. Wow, and um, yeah, I think I think that is uh, amazing. Let's see. Do I have any more any more questions? Um, Another thing I, I got to um, tell the kids out there is that what I, another thing I really, really respect of uh, Bob, and, along with Rick Workman and Steve Thorne, is that, you know, um, you guys live in an aquarium with 211,000 dentists all looking at every move. And when some individual dentist does, uh, his autoclave breaks down and he doesn't know it's not working. And the next thing you know, you know, uh, a bunch of people have hepatitis in Oklahoma and this and that and this and that. And and um, all these tragedies that go wrong, uh, my God, if you do the smallest, littlest thing out of line, you're headline news. And you, you just, um, you guys have to operate a whole nother deal. And I, uh, I admire your innovation. I admire your stamina. I admire, how, how many years have you been at this now? Founded the business 21 years ago. So I've been doing it for 21 years. 21 years. My gosh. Yeah. I now, now I only regret I should have knocked on your door. When I had the chance, <laughs> when I was, it was George Tykowski. You know George Tykowski at Ivaclare? Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. And uh, but anyway, um, but Bob, seriously, and if you could deliver those two Aspen guys to come to the studio, yeah, we'll do a we'll do a follow up for sure. There's no there's no they would I think they would love to do it. Or Dr. Galler. Uh, yeah, Galler on Invisalign. I already had your uh, Sundeep guy and. Um, yeah. And I also, I want you to send me a picture of, of the prize that Lisa Ashby, the president of CareStream Dental, <laughs> what she sends you. I'm just trying to think, what is, is it going to be yeah. like a hundred pounds well, of chocolate? Well, we, or? Negotiated, we negotiated pretty hard, so she might, might, maybe I need to send her something. I don't, I don't really know. But listen, they're wonderful. They're, they've been wonderful partners, as has Henry Schein. We, we have long-term partners. We believe that. Um, we believe in that strategy. And, uh, and I appreciate your comments. We are a little bit of fishbowl. And I, listen, I always say, we're going to be imperfect. We're going to make mistakes. There's no question about it. But we rely on, like, let's do good things for people, right? Well, if we rely on that across the 12,000 people we have, we'll have, a, we'll have a great business and a great practice and patients will have great results. Okay, final, final question. Um, yeah. For Dentistry Uncensored, the, the, a tough question. What are, uh, your, what are your words to dental school deans who the price of their tuition just keeps going higher and higher and higher. And now so many of them are over a hundred thousand dollars a year. And a lot of us older guys are thinking, you know, you're supposed to have one eye on your customer, that dental student and one eye on cost. And you're supposed to use your brain to drive down costs. So your customer can have the afford them to a free. What do you think of these dental school graduate? What do you, what do you think of these dental schools that just raise the price of their tuition and and by the time you get your hands on them, they're they're almost indentured servant slaves. Yeah, well, I wouldn't go that far, maybe, but but they, they do have they do have a lot of challenges. Listen, I don't know that model well enough. I, I don't. And my daughter's going to go to dental school, so I'm you know listen. So we'll be I'll be writing that check pretty soon. Um, but has she picked a dental school yet? She hasn't. She's in the application process now. Well, so we got she we got is, two right here in Arizona: AT School and uh, Midwestern. I know, I know, I know. And she's talked about that. She visited Midwestern uh, when we were out at the call center last year. So she's been out there. But listen, I don't know. I don't know enough about it to have a strong opinion about what tuition is. I do know it creates a lot of hardship. Um, I do know for us, maybe it creates some opportunity indirectly. That's not a re reason to keep tuition high. But because, you know, it's harder for obviously doctors to go into practice on their own. And so for us, you know, listen, we could work closer with the deans. I feel like we're kind of their customer, if you will, because I think there's a lot of information we can give, we can give back to them. And so um, and it's something I think we look forward to doing. All right. Well, Bob, I know you're a busy man with 25,000 employees. Thank you so much for donating an hour to talk to my homies today. I really enjoyed this conversation. All right. We'll see each other soon, Howard. Take All care. Right.